After our next speaker uh, makes some remarks, I'm going to ask Mona Sutphin to come on stage. Mona is a member of the Center on Global Energy Policy's Advisory Board. She's a partner at Macro Advisory Partners, a former Deputy White House Chief of Staff to President Obama, and a member of the President's Intelligence Advisory Board. That's the short version. The, you, the, there's a much longer bio, but I won't go through it all now. And Mona is going to be talking with our next keynote speaker, Jason Furman. Jason serves as the President's Chief Economist, as Chairman of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. He was the, formerly the Principal Deputy at the National Economic Council and worked at the NEC and the CEA, both during the Clinton administration as well. Uh, outside of government, he's held numerous think tank and academic positions. The Washington Post called him the wonkiest wonk in the White House. Uh, I have no doubt this is going to be, nonetheless, a very entertaining conversation. But if it starts to drag or get boring, Jason is also a world-class juggler. I'm talking like unicycles and torches and pretty crazy stuff that he uh, learned growing up from street performers in Washington Square Park, just downtown. I was lucky enough to work for Jason twice once in the National Economic Council and once at the Brookings Institution. Uh, very few people better combine academic and uh, economic analytic brilliance with political savvy and do all that while being incredibly generous, kind, and funny to the people they work with. So I'm really lucky to have learned so much from Jason, and I look forward to learning even more from him right now. Please join me in welcoming to Columbia University, Jason Furman. Uh, thank you um, so much for that that introduction, um, Jason. It was a huge pleasure working with him at the Hamilton Project and in the White House. And he told me he was coming to New York to start something modeled a lot on the Hamilton Project that we worked on together, but focusing um, specifically on energy. What he didn't tell me was your settings would be so much better than what we ever had together um, at the Hamilton Project. And um, it shouldn't really be a surprise to me that the Center on Global Energy Policy has rapidly become um, a center that's not surpassed in the combination of policy analysis, timely relevant understanding of what's going on in energy markets, convening people to discuss those issues, and as I can attest firsthand, having a real impact um, on the debate in Washington. So I thank you for your leadership, um, Jason, and for all of you um, for contributing that and for the opportunity to, to be here today. I'm going to offer some brief remarks and then have a conversation with Mona and, and, and ultimately all of you as well. Um, and wanted to set the scene by talking about what I think is the biggest um, surprise in the last year in the global economy. And that's the nearly 50% decline in the price of oil since last summer. I think this is a big net plus for the US economy. In general, forecasters have raised their estimates of GDP growth in the United States by about a half a point to reflect this decline in the price of oil. They've also raised estimates for growth in some of our key trading partners, which also had had a number of troubles um, and still do have challenges like Europe and China. The reason it has this effect on the economy is that it acts as a tax cut. And it's a tax cut of about $700 per household. That's money in your pocket, money that you're able to spend. I don't think we've seen the full economic benefits of the fall in the price of oil yet, because I think they're still working their way through the system. And it's a process that could take um, up to a year from when the prices started falling to when they fully work their way through the system. And that's because to date, um, a lot of what we've seen is households have saved the windfall they've gotten from spending less on gasoline. We've seen a rise in the personal savings rate over the last three months that's at the 95th percentile of previous increases in the savings rate over that period. So it's a quite unusual increase. And it's one that when I look at the amount of deleveraging consumers have gone through, the amount of confidence they have, um, that I think is just indicative of future potential for consumption. Of course, there's the other part of the equation. And we've seen um, the rig count falling. 
we've seen this way on the total um, growth of investment in our economy as a whole. But all of that, I believe, is outweighed by the consumer side, because as important as the oil sector is to our economy, um, it's still less than 2% of our GDP and less than 1% of our employment. A number of factors have contributed to this dramatic decline in oil prices. Some of them are related to cyclical demand, like slowing growth in China and other emerging market economies. A part of the story that I think has frequently been told, and it's an appropriately so, it's an important part of the story, is the increased supply in the United States, where we've gone from 5 million barrels per day of production in 2008 to 8.7 million barrels per day last year, making the United States the world's largest oil producer, making the increment in oil that we've added enough to make the United States the second largest oil producer um, in OPEC, or would be enough to make us the second largest producer. I think this supply side story is frequently told, but um, especially in contrast to what's happened on the demand side with the consumption of oil in the United States, which is a story that's been told much less but a story that I think is much more important for understanding the dynamics that we've seen in oil markets. Stunningly, we are in a situation where in the year 2014, Americans consumed less petroleum than they did in the year 1997, despite the fact that the economy was 46% larger than it was in 1997. So you had a half century in which oil consumption generally rose and rose, and then you had it level off and actually decline. Um, this is something no one was expecting. If you look at the EIA forecasts in 2003, and I say this not to pick on EIA, I say this because I think they're the best forecasts around and are similar to what others were forecasting. And you compare where they thought we would be in the year 2014 in terms of petroleum consumption to where we actually were in the year 2014. We were 6.4 million barrels lower on consumption than they expected. So that consumption surprise, the unexpected reduction in consumption, was about twice the magnitude of the unexpected increase in supply. Importantly, that decline in consumption wasn't just a passing phenomenon, or isn't just projected to be a passing phenomenon. If you look at EIA's forecast through the year 2025, instead of projecting steady increases in the consumption of petroleum as they had, they have basically a line that is flat. Importantly, this is also um, a really American story. You see some, um, if you look at the International Energy Agency, you see for other OECD countries, oil consumption has come in a little bit below the forecast, but nowhere nearly as dramatically below as for the United States. And that little difference in other OECD economies is largely um, explained by the fact that their GDP hasn't been as high as what was expected Whereas in the United States, a really important part of the story is a decline in the amount of oil we use per unit of GDP. If you look at that reduction in oil consumption, the majority of it is in the transportation sector, but you also see it in industrial and residential um, and commercial sectors as well. To date, about three quarters of that decline is due to a reduction in vehicle miles traveled, due to factors like um, the higher gas prices, the fact that GDP wasn't as high as we expected, um, as well as a range of other factors, including um, demography and other unexplained issues. But to date, a quarter of it is because of imp improved fuel economy, including the steps that were taken 
to raise the fuel standards for light vehicles and then in this administration for cars and for heavy trucks as well. Going forward by 2025, the projected re reduction in consumption um, is nearly half accounted for by these types of fuel efficiency. And then coming on top of the fewer miles traveled and the greater fuel efficiency is a substitution for alternative fuels like ethanol, which has further reduced the consumption. Petroleum. Uh, why does all of this matter? Um, it matters, first of all, because this increase in production and even larger decline relative to expectations and consumption is contributing to the lower oil prices, and that is good for the U.S. economy. But oil prices are going to go up and down, and I don't have a prediction for what they are in the future, except that in the future they will probably both at various times go up and at various times go down. But the fact that the United States is on net consuming about six and a half million barrels per day less than projected, producing about three and a half million barrels per day more than projected, means on net we've improved our position by 10 million barrels per day, a nearly 50% reduction in our imports relative to what we projected. And that means whatever happens to oil, whether it goes up or down or does some combination of both, it's not going to affect our economy as much as it would have otherwise. Um, we're considerably um, less vulnerable to oil shocks than in the past. And then from a global perspective, that 10 million barrels per day is more than a tenth of global production. It's a really big difference um, in the world as a whole. In addition to these economic effects that um, Administrator McCarthy was also talking about in the end of her remarks, I want to bring myself over to her turf now and say that this really proves that you can have an energy strategy that's compatible with a climate strategy as well. And this reduction in petroleum consumption combined with an increase in natural gas and a shift away from coal an expansion in renewables and our overall improvement in energy efficiency are how we've cut our greenhouse gas emissions by nearly 10 percent relative to the 2005 level and how we're in a position to put in place policies in the power sector and the auto sector methane renewables a range of other areas within the administrative power um, that the president has to hit the goal that we're going into Paris with of reducing emissions by 26 to 28 percent by 2025. So I think overall you can see that one of the most economic, biggest economic surprises in the past year has also been compatible with one of the biggest um, you know, turnarounds in our progress on climate change in a very long time. And we want to build on that progress, both economically and in addressing our environmental challenges as we move forward. Thank you. Ask me about anything but sports. So yeah, she no better on there, honor that agreement. Yeah. Don't worry. I wouldn't do that. So did you watch that Bucks game last night? No, just kidding. Um, <clears throat> so first, thank you, uh, Jason, for the remarks. It's nice to be back. Um, Jason and I were close colleagues, and I have to say he was um, definitely one of my smartest colleagues uh, in, the, in the team um, working on a range of these issues. Um, so I'm going to ask, since I'm the moderator, I get the benefit of uh, asking the first couple of questions uh, and then we'll open it up to the audience. And I think there's somebody passing around cards and um, I'll go through those when, when you, if you have questions. So um, first I wanted to pick up on one element that you talked about, which is obviously the low oil price environment. and it's very clear it's a net benefit to the economy in your view. And I just wanted to get a sense of whether you think at some point um, that benefit starts to diminish over time because of what we're seeing in terms of not so much the direct uh, impact on oil sector employment per se, but kind of the indirect effect over time um, given the interest and in having so much investment in, in the midstream and also downstream 
and whether or not you see an associated employment, whether in your mind there is some moment at which, um, not so much that the downsides that it's still not a net benefit, but where you start to get concerned that a central pillar of what has been a pretty robust uh, employment growth picture starts to, starts to worry you. I think a lot of the media commentary started out enthusiastic when prices fell to 100, 90, maybe even 80, saying this is gonna be great for our economy. And then they fell a little bit further, and the ratio of news stories, this is not, I haven't added them up myself, but my casual sense, became much higher um, in terms of negative stories about you know, this project stopped, this you know, well not drilled, um, than positive. And then every month you get the jobs data, and you definitely see it in the jobs data. You see in this sector um, a slowdown in job growth or job loss as a result of this price change. Uh, the problem is that it's harder to see in the economic data the widespread effect of people spending more on everything from you know, their corner restaurant to American-made automobiles to, um, you know, throughout the economy. And that doesn't make those benefits any less real. So most of the models, I think, quite consistently and clearly tell us that we're a net oil importer. And as a net oil importer, a lower price means we're paying less for something from the rest of the world. That leaves us with more money as a country to spend, and that's good for us. I tend to think to a first approximation that's linear, so every $10 the price drops, you get an extra tenth of GDP. Insofar as you think on the oil supply curve, there's some flatter parts and some steeper parts, you could get some nonlinearity if you move past some price and you lose you know, more production than in any other $10, but I don't, um, wouldn't surprise me if that was true, but I don't think there's enough of a convincing reason for me to think that you know, each $10 isn't as good as the last and um, you know, all, of it's, all of it's good for the U.S. economy. And let me just press you a little bit more on the infrastructure question, because is there something about what might happen, not so much the oil curve itself, but um, that would make you start to worry that some of the CapEx, some of the really interesting investment going on in the mid part of the country, that that might start to wane as well and have longer term impact on, on, uh, on what we're hoping to see, no. employment-wise or otherwise. What, Instability, I think, should mm -hmm. worry us. So if the price went down to $5 well, and then yeah. back up to 200 okay. then back down to right. 5 you know, it would sort of rather take something in the middle than that type of gyration. So I think if you thought a low price was permanent, I think that would probably only be good on net for the economy as a whole, even though um, it would certainly have winners and losers associated with it. If you thought it was temporarily low, then that extra uncertainty might weigh on investment in a way that wasn't commensurate to the benefits um, consumers would get. So I think it's more insofar as low is temporarily low that you worry, not that low is low. Low, yeah, I got you. Um, so let me switch gears a little bit to our former colleague Larry Summers and his um, secular stagnation uh, debate that he set off. I'm going to ask you where you are in that debate, by the way. But before that, I've been really struck that a lot of the um, projections you see in this sector assume, um, you know, a period of low prices, but then prices rebound, and ultimately, medium and long term, that you see a pretty robust growth in commodity prices and energy demand generally, driven by um, China and India. I'm just curious if, um, if, if Larry and now the IMF seems to appear that the, the secular stagnation story may in fact be right, whether or not um, it strikes me that there might be a pretty profound disconnect in what people assume might happen with commodity prices and what really could be going on in the global economy. And so I just am curious where you come down on the famous secular stagnation debate um, and whether or not you think we should be cautious about what we think is going to happen down the line, right, in terms of energy demand or China and India. So when it comes to um, scary, is Larry here yet? Is he coming? Oh, he's <laughs> no, not coming. Great. Okay. Uh, when it comes to scary <laughs> pessimistic, he's going to come running through that door right here and come for. When yeah. it comes to scary pessimistic <laughs> hypotheses that Larry has put on the table, um, there's one that he put on the table in a paper with Lamp Pritchett, and I don't know if he has coined a name for it yet, but I'd call it the luck of nations that worries me more than secular stagnation. So in that paper, 
he looked at periods when countries did extraordinarily well in terms of their growth over, let's say, a 20-year period, and then looked at what happened in the next 20 years and found that they didn't do extraordinarily well. You saw this with you know, Japan in the early 90s. We thought you know, extrapolating out, it's going to own the entire universe in 20 years, and that's not how it worked out. And their argument is that extraordinary growth is partly luck and partly structural, and the luck goes away, the structure stays there, you revert back towards the mean and your growth falls. And without going into any of the China watching type of details of construction and the tertiary sector mm -hmm. and the banking this and the whatever that, um, this theory gives you a framework for thinking that you know part of what's happened in China, part of what's happened in India is luck. Part of it is convergence um, to the technological frontier and that neither of those forces are gonna be as available going forward. So I think that actually could mean that the growth rates we've extrapolated off the past are inflated and we need to bring them down. And the IMF has done that some. In fact, the biggest adjustments it's made in global growth are to the BRICS. Half of their downward adjustment to global GDP has come from the BRICS. So I think that is a real thing. I think that is something we should be really concerned about. Um, in terms of secular stagnation in the United States and sort of a technical meaning associated with a permanently low equilibrium interest rate, um, I don't think that's particularly relevant for where we are right now in the U.S. economy. We feel, to me, like we're almost all the way recovered. Demand is still important, but we don't have some type of chronically deficient demand. I'm a little bit worried that the next time we go into a recession, that we're more likely to hit the zero lower bound, monetary policy be somewhat constrained, and so it's important that um, we, for example, learn the lesson of the importance of fiscal policy. But that doesn't tell you anything about the future of oil prices, yeah. but since you asked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and to, to the question of how you feel about the U.S. Um, outlook, how worried about you? I, I noticed in the March employment report you really did comment on the global forces as weighing a little bit on U.S. growth. Parse out for me how concerned you are about what's going on um, in the situation in Greece, for example, in China. Is that something that's kind of uppermost in your mind of something we need to watch really carefully? Or do you feel like the U.S. economy is pretty resilient given all the headwinds from the days we were in the White House together, it felt like every time we had some forward progress, something would come from out of left field and kind of whack us back. Are, you feel pretty good that we're really past that, or do you think we could find ourselves in a much more right. precarious spot? I feel mostly good that we're past that. <laughs> um, the first fact is the United States economy is 87% domestic. We're much less exposed to the rest of the world than most other economies around the world are. I think we have a lot of domestic momentum. I talked about consumer spending, where I don't think we have seen the full benefits um, of the fall in the price of gasoline. But if there is something that worried me about the US economy in the next year or two, number one would be if I thought Congress wasn't gonna get its act together, deal with the sequester, and avoid brinksmanship, I'd be worried. They say they're not gonna have a problem with that, and I'm happy to take them at their word. Um, really? But then the, <laughs> take them at their word. Um, and uh, the, the second, though, is the rest of the world. And that has definitely weighed on U.S. growth. You've seen our, our exports slow um, quite a lot. And you know, that's partly why we need to make sure we're taking steps here to insulate ourselves with things like investments in infrastructure. It's partly why we need to engage with the rest of the world to help them strengthen their economies and to work with them on that. And it's partly why... Um, we need trade agreements like um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership to knock down barriers to our exports and, and help our economy in that way. Mm -hmm. So um, this is my last question, I promise, and I'll switch to the ones from the audience. But let me You don't ask, need to tell them which is I which. I know, I know. No, but I just, just in case people are worried. Why is she asking all the questions? But um, which is when we head into the um, Paris Climate Summit in December, I'm just curious what you say, A, whether or not you, how, um, easy or difficult it will be to reach the administration's goal, how much we need to do at home to kind of prove our bona fides in, in some respects. Um, but what do you say to people who will say, well, it's actually kind of a zero sum. You can't both achieve our climate goals and really accomplish a sustainable and growing domestic kind of production story. I know you said it's, it's, it's possible to do, but for a lot of outsiders, I think it seems like it's very zero sum and that trade-off is really hard. So can you just give us a sense of how inside the rooms where these things get decided, when you're making decisions, is it how you balance trade those two, two issues off, those two goals off? Right. 
So in terms of the first, we feel great um, about uh, going into the Paris talks. We feel that the United States has a leadership position um, that we haven't had before on these talks. We have a track record to point to in terms of the carbon emissions we've already done, in terms of the major steps we've taken, which will further reduce carbon emissions going forward, and in the fact that the president can say, this is a goal, and I can achieve this goal. Um, I have the tools um, to achieve it. And um, we also feel good because the basic theory that, you know, if the United States leads, that will help other countries come along, and that we ultimately need everyone to act on this, but that sometimes, you know, starting out on the path and bringing someone else along um, is being validated. So you see the historic agreement with China, which again, um, committing to peak its, its emissions, which again, I think is a result of our leading by example and then working um, together to bring them along. And it's also a result of China understanding um, its interests, including its local um, environmental interests. So we feel good going into that. And I think we have a good story to tell that a smart energy policy is consistent with um, a smart climate policy. And a lot of my remarks were about that decline in petroleum consumption. That's a great example of that. The increase in natural gas and what that does for carbon emissions is another um, example of that. So I think it's fully compatible um, wanting to develop energy and wanting to reduce emissions. And you know, the basic way in which you make them compatible is, is a test, which is we have a social cost of carbon that we use as an administration. If you can reduce emissions for less than that per ton, it's a great thing to do economically and you should do it. And if it's extremely costly to reduce emissions, um, well above that social cost of carbon, then you shouldn't do it. You should find another more efficient way to do it. And there's more than enough emissions reductions we can do um, in an efficient manner that we don't need to do those other ones um, and we shouldn't do those other ones. So I think that's how we reconcile the two yep. in those rooms. Okay. so. Um, I'm going to shift to questions. We got a first question from, from Twitter for uh, Jason. I had no idea Twitter was here. Chair of CEA. I know. Did you know that there's a Twitter person sitting in the back? I didn't even know that either. Um, uh, how do you see low energy prices impacting the development of renewables? And I guess this was asked by several people. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the opposite right. of the other I, question I was right. asking. I think it's a factor in the development of renewables, but I think it's only a factor. So the clean power plan that we're doing for power plants, one of the building blocks that we use to determine the state targets and one of the options that state have to, states have to meet that target is through renewables. So that'll give a big impetus to renewables. The um, president's tax reform would include making permanent and making refundable tax incentives for clean energy. That would have um, a big impact on renewables as well. And then just developments in the market as the price, you know, on the one hand, the price you're competing with is falling, but on the other hand, the price at which renewables are competitive is also falling and it's, it's chasing the other one. So um, again, I think with the right policy steps, this is fully compatible um, with more uh, renewables, but it creates a challenge and needs to redouble our resolve to take those steps. And do you, by the way, do you just, would you watch that a lot in, inside the CEA, kind of what's happening in terms of investment in various sectors in the renewable space in particular, or kind um, of yeah, no, the board, is that something? That. Yeah. And, and the overall trend has been an enormous increase yeah. um, in, the last, uh, in the last eight years. Yeah. Um, another question is, why aren't you concerned that oil price, lower oil prices will encourage people to drive more? undermining the goals, the climate goals and energy independence goals. And I did notice that there's a spike in purchase of uh, large SUVs again, suddenly um, people making decisions, snap purchases, right. I guess. Part of that surprising decline in consumption that I was talking about um, is related to the higher price of gasoline over that period, uh, the rise in the price of gasoline over that period. And that part of it, um, insofar as prices stayed lower, would go away. Um, but it's only part of it. And there's a lot more to the reduction in oil relative to what was expected um, than just the price surprise. And if you look at the price surprise and combine it with your standard consumption elasticity, 
um, you can basically see um, that it doesn't fully explain it. So price is one factor, but at the same time, our fuel efficiency standards for heavy vehicles went into effect starting last year. And for, um, for light trucks and for cars, they're phasing in every year for the next several years. So that's a factor that goes um, you know, in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so here's one. That, how is the US less subject to oil shocks uh, when we import over 7 million barrels a day and all but three of it uh, comes from unstable regions in the world? Um, and then the, we're not willing to build more to get the pipelines to get more from Canada. So it's essentially a keystone question. <laughs> As all questions uh, come back to being a the answer to question, the second part of the question is the State Department. <laughs> um, the answer to the first part of the question is, um, you know, it's all it's all relative. Um, and absolutely, we are a net oil importer. So when oil prices decline, it's good for the U.S. economy. When oil prices rise. Um, it's bad for the U.S. economy. So we are affected by events around the world that affect the price of oil. It's just insofar as our imports are smaller as a share of GDP than they were, we're less affected than we were. And if we continue to bring down those imports as a share of GDP, um, we'll be even less affected. So this isn't a matter of eliminating the impact of the rest of the world. Um, it's a matter of um, minimizing it. And this is a question that came from somebody else, which is, um, I'm not sure you necessarily would have gotten involved in this, but the net impact, uh, potential economic impact if Keystone were approved. I think that's the State Department that analysis, is also right? That's the State also, Department. He doesn't have to worry about that, so he is not the Keystone person. Um, and uh, one other question, which I know we always get, which is about uh, exports, crude oil exports. Um, why not allow them? Um, from the lower 48, right. going to take the plunge. <laughs> yeah, that's um, you know, it's, it's an important and complicated issue. Um, there's a number of different economic, environmental, geopolitical factors um, that one would want to think about in that area. And what I would point out is you know, ways in which the administration has, for example, um, clarified, the Commerce Department has clarified the rules around condensates, for example, and that's making it much more transparent, much more predictable what under the existing rules can and can't be exported. And together with the evolution of production we're seeing is um, you know, relieving some of the bottlenecks mm -hmm. um, that people were worried mm -hmm. about. And do you think, uh, just to go to the TPP and TPA um, question, um, can I, I just wanted to get your sense of how the arguments are playing in, in Washington for the, for the trade deal. Um, I mean, I see the president out fairly frequently trying to make the case for this deal, um, since I care about it so much, it's a little off the energy front, but uh, important nonetheless. Um, do you think that we've gotten um, that A, it's going to be successful, and B, that people really understand the importance of having a more integrated, tied economy with Asia? You think that's kind of a hard sell with the American public? You know, there's no doubt that trade is a complicated and divisive issue, and we've seen that. And partly I understand that because there are challenges associated with globalization. I think it would be wrong um, to deny that. Um, the case that we need to make is that TPP allows us to better manage that process of globalization. So we're going to have a lot of trade with all these countries, with or without TPP. TPP means we're going to have higher labor standards, higher environmental standards, uh, ways to address state-owned enterprises, a free internet, a whole range of things that it locks in that you wouldn't have had otherwise. It means that we'll tear down barriers that are disproportionately placed to US exports, um, whereas our economy is already um, quite open on the tariff side and very transparent on um, the, the non-tariff side. So making that case that um, there's a huge opportunity here in terms of where the consumers are and the consumers of the future, but that also this is part of addressing the worries people have about globalization, the way um, that this agreement is designed. You know, I think there's some people you can persuade of that. I think some of the arguments I've heard against it, frankly, to me, seem 
you know, a little bit relying on straw men or, or myths and um, really are quite at variance with the evidence. Um, we're making the case. We were really pleased that you saw both Democrats and Republicans voting in both the Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee to create a negotiating mandate from the Congress to the President that would be transparent, that would set the objectives that we need to follow, give a transparent way for Congress to consider it. Far more time to read this trade agreement than most other pieces of legislation Congress passes. I mean, most things go on the internet one night, voted on the next morning. This will be up there for 60 days for people to study when we have the agreement. And uh, so I think it's moving forward. And you expect it to come up for a vote in this session? I know that's the plan. Uh, we at least, expect right? it to come up uh, yeah. very soon. Yeah. Um, so uh, another question. Does U.S. energy growth improve our macroeconomic competitiveness? Yeah, I think it has helped. Um, we, in the economic report of the president this past year, had a chapter on energy. And we documented that the direct effects of oil and gas were adding about 0.2 percentage point per year to U.S. GDP growth. And I don't know if that sounds like a large or a small number to all of you. For an economist, an instrument that raises your growth rate by two tenths is great. You collect five of those instruments and you have an extra point a year. and That's really, really great. Um, so that's, that's meaningful and that's, that's big and, and that's just the direct effect. Um, now, the changing prices and all that will mean these numbers will be different over the next couple of years, but on balance, yes, I think it's helping the United States. Um, and let me ask you about um, the, e the Eurozone in Greece. Um, what's your outlook for the EU and the Greece situation? I mean, I think now at, now at this point, people are worried more about an accident, really, uh, today. Although, depending on the on the news cycle at this very moment, we might be worried about something else with that. How much does that? Um, how worried are you about that? And what's your outlook for EU growth when we constantly are revisiting the very function of the of the eurozone itself? Yeah, I think it's encouraging that in the last two months or so, the stream of data we've seen from Europe has generally surprised on the upside relative to what we expected. Partly that's a reflection that our expectations had been set so low that it wasn't that hard to come in above that bar. But partly it's the fall in the price of oil, more vigorous monetary policy, and getting their act together in terms of a more neutral fiscal policy um, have all helped the um, European economies relative to what we thought. The problem going forward isn't what our best case estimate for European growth is, it's what the downside risk is going forward, and that downside risk starts in Greece, um, but the worry we have is that it doesn't end in Greece. And right now, a lot in the markets think it ends in Greece. They think that the rest of Europe isn't holding Greek debt, that they're somehow insulated from it. Um, I'm far from certain that that's the case and think it's too large a risk um, for us to take lightly for the European economy and for the global economy, and that's why I think it's encouraging that you see movement both from Greece and their partners in Europe to get together and actually have real concrete sleeves rolled up conversations about how to figure out um, a path forward. And do you think that there's a, that that message is really sunk in with all the parties? I mean, I, I, I always get the feeling that the Greeks are hoping that the U.S. will come in and kind of right. carry a little bit of its water with the right. Europeans and vice versa, that, you know, we'll, we'll side with the Germans or whoever it is at the moment who's pushing right. the Greeks hard. Well, I'm um, at a disadvantage in answering this question because we've been on stage together for about 45 minutes, minutes, so who knows what's happened? <laughs> right, because I know the feeling. Because every 45 minutes, right, the situation knows, can right? change. <laughs> um, so anyone out there reading Twitter may yeah, be better may say, than oh, I they've am. broken off talks um, and the whole, yeah. But you know, the signs in the last few days have been encouraging. Um, in terms of the steps the Prime Minister has taken. We've had a lot of conversations with him. We've had conversations with others in Europe, and the message we have is really clear and consistent. Um, this wouldn't be good for Greece. It wouldn't be good for Europe. It wouldn't be good for the global economy. So get together, roll up your sleeves, um, figure out how to And you think forward. that argument's been really absorbed? Because at various points... It feels points... more... There have been some encouraging signs. But no, we're not, we're not there yet. And how worried are you about an exit? There's a question of an affirmative kind of Grexit scenario, but how worried are you about um, just an accident, right? I mean, we've got a lot of 
writing on I the line and I don't think we want to find out the answer to that. your question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can play that. <laughs> That'd be good, right? Um, okay, I'm going to switch back. I'm switching between U.S. and, and uh, international questions. But um, how does CEA use um, a carbon price? So we worked closely with OIRA, the regulatory administrators that, in, that are part of the Office of Management and Budget, to develop a social cost of carbon. We did that based on um, the best research, synthesizing it. And now that's a common social cost of carbon that's used for regulation throughout the executive branch. And you know, it's a simple concept, which is each ton of carbon does a set of damage that we can measure. It's about $37 a ton, and it rises over time. And so if regulations can reduce carbon for less than that, they're a good idea. For more than that, um, you know, they're not, they're not a good idea. And that price is also consistent with hitting the emissions targets we need to hit, um, which are part of hitting uh, you know, a, global, a global temperature target. Yeah. And this will be, I think, the last question, um, which is, um, where do you see the biggest growth opportunity for the U.S. Uh, energy industry? Do you have a view on? You know, if I knew the answer to that, that question, I wouldn't be, be sitting in government. Here. I'd be, be yeah. in some type of job or, or maybe at the center for for global energy policy. <laughs> um, but no, I think our job is to be a little bit neutral in answer to a question like that. Get the regulatory incentives right so that you're leveling the playing field. So if renewables have a positive externality, if carbon associated with you know, coal fuel power plants have a negative externality, that you have something that takes that into account, um, and then let the market figure out the answers to those questions. So uh, I think there's a lot of potential in a lot of different energy sectors, but the, the relative ratio of them is something um, that the market will have to figure out, and we just have to make sure it figures that out in a way that's consistent um, with sustainable um, growth and, and addressing our climate challenges. Okay. Well, please join me in thanking uh, Jason. Thank